January is done. I can't believe it. The month went by so fast, so quick. And this was the first book that we read together for the Catholic Reads 2023 Challenge. And I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. As I mentioned in my introduction video for the challenge, I have already read this once. This was my second time reading it. And it was such a pleasure to read it again a second time. The first time I read it, I was in the middle of converting. And so a lot of what was very important for me was the beginning of the book. And I'll explain a little bit more after. But this time, it was the second half of the book that resonated most for me. And if you want to join, it's not too late. The sign up is in the description below. And I think I'm going to put it in the comments so that you can see that as well. I'm so happy there are some of you who have joined. And there are a couple of you who have joined the Telegram group. So if you join, you'll be getting hopefully weekly almost weekly emails from me about the book to help motivate you some of my insights and if you join you can join if you can join you can join if you join there is also the telegram group there you can share your favorite passages your insight on things and you can interact with other people who are doing the challenge and you can interact with me this past saturday was the first live discussion we had about the book and I hope next time I get to see you uh, join in as well. So sign up below. All the information will be sent to your email. And I cannot wait to see you on Telegram or just at least in my email box. So Mere Christianity. This is a beautiful, beautiful book. This is a wonderful book for anyone who's just discovering the faith. Christianity in general. It's divided up into four books. The first book deals more with... The concept of God and why it's logical and how you can prove it without, you know, having the Bible or anything like that. It's pure logic. And he, the way he does that is brilliant because it's not through science, because we put science on such a, you know, on a pedestal nowadays. He does it through the law of nature and how the law of nature is a greater proof uh, to use for the existence of God. And I find that very, very fascinating because it is, it is through you and I, every human being in the world has this standard, we have the standard of morality, the moral law, whether we agree with it or not. And it is universal for many, many things. And we live in such a <laughs> subjective society. Everything is my opinion and it, it there's no real truth my truth and your truth can be completed completely different things but the moral law things that are right and wrong are always right and wrong it's just we justify our actions because we're we want to uphold this standard of good to other people except with exceptions for ourselves. And he, he does a brilliant job of, of talking about that. The second book is to explain what Christians actually believe. Like I said, this, this first and second book, the first part of mere Christianity was great for me when I was converting. It's great for me now in the sense that I can use these arguments when I'm talking to someone about the faith. And you arrive to the conclusion, yes, that yeah, there's no other way. Christianity is the way to God. It also talks about how God is good, infinitely good. There are still people today that believe that there is a good God and a bad God and they're at rivals with each other. And, and so he talks about how this doesn't make any sense because for the good God, what he's doing is good. And for the bad God, what he is doing is good. And also, there cannot be two gods, otherwise... That is not the supreme being. There must be a supreme being. It's He talks about the philosophy of God, but in a very, very accessible way. And he does a better job of it than I am doing right now. Book three is about Christian behavior, cardinal virtues, um, and theological virtues. A bit about like how can we human beings believe in these good things and also, but at the same time, reject them as a Christian, you know, we, 
we all know that there are bad Christians. I am a bad Christian at times. We're not perfect. And so how is this possible? And I think this part is great for those converting to the Christian faith who don't really have a good understanding of what we Christians actually believe. And these are things that all Christians believe. You know, we might have differences in the details of things, but these things like marriage and sex and morality, cardinal virtues, theological virtues, these are things that all Christians believe. What really got to me in book three was the part with forgiveness and faith, faith, hope, and charity. It really got to me. The forgiveness, uh, the wonderful quote that he has about forgiveness. Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive, which is so true. <laughs> Forgiving someone is so hard to do. We love the idea. We everybody. It's the same with with other um, moral standards that we uphold. We uphold it to other people, but when it comes to us, when it comes back to us, we have such a difficult time with it because of pride, charity, 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 with love, with love, with love. The the part where he talks about when you give in, ter in terms of alms giving. When it doesn't hurt, that means you probably didn't give enough. And like, I thought that really, uh, it really resonated with me in the times that I did give. Was it enough? Probably not. I could probably keep giving more until it kind of hurts a bit. And that's when it really is a real gift of charity. Faith isn't blind. Faith is an action of the will, which is... People so misunderstand faith. Now faith, in the sense in which I am here using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. And I love this one. I love this part too. No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. My husband had this discussion with a colleague the other day um, he brought up the faith and started talking about it. And his colleague said, I could never be Catholic or Christian because I'm a bad boy, were his words. Meaning that he could never possibly, you know, be, be bad, be good because of all the things that he's done. And also he doesn't want to change. But the thing is, my husband, unfortunately, he said, he said that he, gre he regrets that he, he wasn't able to say what he wanted to say because they were in the middle of work, was that he wanted to say something like, those men that went and fought in the Crusades, do you think all of them were good in the sense of what, you, what how you think good is? You know, every, every saint has a past and a sinner a future. And back to the faith thing, perfectly said, it is the art of holding on to things your reason has accepted in spite of your changing moods. Emotions come and go. I feel like a good analogy for this is like, uh, especially for people who are stay-at-home mom and dads, you know, your whole day, if someone were to ask you your whole day with your children, especially little ones, well, you could say that you you fought the war, you won the war, you, you, <laughs> you cried, you laughed, you, you did everything, everything. It's kind of like that, but you still love your children. Even at the moments when you feel like everything's going to just fall apart, but faith is an act of the will. You have to do it. And it is a continuation of reason. A book for really did it for me this time, the second time I read it, because it talked about a bit of theology. The thing I love about C.S. Lewis is that he's so descriptive. His analogies are so easy to understand. One of my favorite analogies that he used was when he was talking about how God can be three persons, but one being. And he used the description, the image of a cube. So first you start off with a line, and that's the first dimension. And then if you make four lines, then that makes a square, and that's a two-dimensional shape. But you still have the four lines, individual lines. And then if you make six squares, 
that involves all the lines, the squares, and it creates the 3D object, which is the cube, and that is God. God is like a cube with all the lines, six faces, but also this one physical thing. And I thought that was such a great analogy. I don't remember that at all from the first time I read it, but the second time, it really hit me. And another one was, how can God be everywhere and at any time? Because people people ask, like, how can God hear all these prayers when he's just one person? And, you know, how can he hear my prayers, your prayers, all these people's prayers at exactly the same time? And so he described as how God is out of time is that there's a line drawn on a piece of paper. You and I are here. And this is the future. This is the past. And there's this whole line, right, on the piece of paper. But God is actually the paper. He is in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. There is no time for God. He has all of eternity to hear from you, to hear uh, for you. Whatever is happening now, you watching me, is happening at this moment. But God already saw that, sees that, and will see that. He sees it as a map. So maybe you are in, I don't know, <laughs> in Kentucky, uh, in the US, and I'm in France, but God sees you and me at that, you know, I, I guess that's a, a different analogy. So, um, I think he used that too as a map. He sees the whole thing. Ooh, he sees the whole thing. And he's everywhere at the same time. Because there is no time. Time does not exist. He is outside of it. And and my one of my other favorite analogies that he used was how can God be out of time? Is that of an an author, an author writing a novel, the author of Little Red Riding Hood thinks writes about you know Little Red Riding Hood getting ready for going to her grandmother's and then as he writes that he has to stop and pause for little red riding hood what's happening is just her putting on her clothes but for the author he's thinking about what's gonna happen next who's gonna who's gonna come what other characters there are where she's gonna go which path she's gonna take you know what i mean the whole image is there whereas for little red She's only in the process. She is in her time, in the process of putting on her her little red hood. <laughs> I really, really, really love that. And of course, the part where he talks about we're all little Christs. As we say, I never expected to be a saint. I only wanted to be a decent, ordinary chap. And we imagine when we say this that we are being humble. <laughs> God expects so much from us and he wants perfection and this the funny thing is is like we we think that we know what's best but we really don't I, this is one of my favorite quotes the real son of god is at your side he's beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself he is beginning so to speak to inject his kind of life and thought his zoe into you, beginning to turn the tin soldier into a live man. The part of you that does not like it is the part that is still tin. <laughs> we have so, we're so difficult, right? We want, we want the best, what we think is best, but what he has in store for us is something greater. And that's the thing, we got to give up everything to him. Until you have given up yourself to him, you will not have a real self. Sameness is to be found most among the most natural men, not among those who surrender to Christ. How monotonously alike all the great tyrants and conquerors have been. How gloriously different are the saints. And this made me think about all the saints and angels, right? You have Saint Jean d'Arc, Saint Thérèse de Lisieux, Saint Padre Pio, Saint Cardinal Newman, so different, but they're all the same in terms of being united with Christ, and that's the thing. That was the greatest message at the end: is that we are we are to become new men, 
our true selves. And in order to do that, we got to give it all to God. We got to lose ourselves to become our true selves. So if you want to join me and the rest of these wonderful people who have already joined in the challenge, it is not too late. Go ahead and sign up below and I will see you in the next one. Silence by Shusako Endo Chapter 1 Letter of Sebastian Rodriguez Pax Christi Praised be Christ I have already told you about how we arrived at Goa last year on October 9th, and now on May 1st, we have reached Macau. Amidst all the difficulties and privations of the journey, Juan de Santa Marta became utterly exhausted, and it looked as if he was getting malaria. So only Francis Garpe and myself are working with all our strength at the missionary college here. We certainly received a wonderful welcome. The problem is, however, that Father Valignano, rector of the college, who has been here for 10 years, has been utterly opposed to our journey to Japan. In his room overlooking the bay, he spoke to us at length, and this is the gist of what he said. I am obliged to refuse to send any more missionaries to Japan. The sea journey is extremely dangerous for Portuguese ships, and you will encounter all sorts of obstacles before even setting foot in the country. His opposition is not altogether unreasonable. In view of the fact that since 1636, the Japanese government, suspecting that the Portuguese were in some way connected with the Shimbara rebellion, has completely cut all commercial relationship with them. Not only this, but in the journey from Macau, the seas neighboring on Japan are infested by English ships, are infested by English and Dutch warships, which open fire on our trading ships. And yet our secret mission could, with God's help, turn out successful, said Juan de Santa Marta, blinking his eyes fervently. In that stricken land, the Christians have lost their priests and are like a flock of sheep without a shepherd. Someone must go to give them courage and to ensure that the tiny flame of faith does not die out. At these words, a shadow passed over Valignano's face, and he remained silent. No doubt, to this very day, he was deeply troubled by the dilemma of his duty as a superior and the fate of the unfortunate persecuted Christians. And so the old man said no word resting his forehead on his hands. From his room, the harbor of Macau could be seen in the distance. The sea was red in the evening sun. Black junks floated on the water, scattered here and there like black smudges. And one more point. We have an added duty. We want to find out the truth about our teacher, Ferreira. About Ferreira, we have no further news. The reports about him are vague. Anyhow, at present, we don't have any plans for investigating the truth or falsity of what has been said about him. Is he alive? Even that, we don't know. Valignano raised his head and heaved a deep sigh as he spoke. The reports sent me regularly from the year 1633 have come to a sudden end. Whether he unhappily got sick and died, whether he is lying in prison of the infidel, whether, as you are imagining, he won a glorious martyrdom, or whether he is still alive trying to send some report but unable to do so, about this, at present, we can say nothing. Valignano did not so much as utter a word about rumors that Ferreira had succumbed beneath the torture of his enemies. Like us, he was loth to attribute such fanciful charges to his old friend. Moreover, and now Valignano spoke with some emphasis, in Japan, there has now appeared a person who is indeed a terror for the Christians. His name is Inoue. This was the first time we had heard the name of Inoue. Valignano went on to say that in comparison with the savagery of Inoue, someone like Takenaka, the former magistrate of Nagasaki, who had butchered so many Christians, was no more than a simple-minded person. And so to imprint on our memories the name of this Japanese, whom we would undoubtedly meet after landing in Japan, we repeated the unfamiliar sounds again and again. Inoue. From the last report sent by Christians in Kyushu, Valignano had a good deal of knowledge about this man. Since the rebellion of the Shimbara, he had become for all practical purposes the architect of the Christian persecution. Quite unlike his predecessor, Takenaka, he was cunning as a serpent, so that the Christians who until now had not flinched at threats and tortures succumbed one by one to his cunning wiles. And the sad fact, went on Valiano, is that he was formerly of our faith. He is even baptized. And about this persecutor, I will probably be able to give you more information later on. But what I want to tell you just now is that Valiano, 
prudent superior though he is, was finally moved by our pleading, especially by that of Garpe, and consented to our secret mission to Japan. So now the die is cast. For the conversion of Japan and the glory of God, we have somehow made our way to the east. Now we face a future which is certainly fraught with even greater perils and hardships, that sea journey around Africa and across the ocean. Now we face a future which is certainly fraught with even greater perils and hardships that the sea journey around Africa and across the Indian Ocean. But if you are persecuted in one town, flee to another. And within my heart, there constantly arise the words of the apocalypse that honor and glory and power belong to God alone. As I have told you, Macao is at the mouth of the great river Chukyang. It is built on one of the many islands with which the entrance to the bay is studded. And like all the towns of the east, there is no wall surrounding it, so that it is impossible to say where the city boundaries are. The Chinese houses stretch out like dust, but anyhow, no matter how many towns and cities of our country you imagine, you can never get a picture of what it is like. The population is said to be about 20,000, but this number is most certainly false. The only things here that might recall our own country are the governor's palace, the Portuguese warehouses, and cobbled roads. A fortress with cannons standing facing out into the bay, but fortunately until this day the cannons have never had to go into action. The greater part of the Chinese show no interest in our teaching. On this point, Japan is undoubtedly, as St. Francis Xavier said, the country in the Orient most suited to Christianity. However, ironically enough, as a result of the Japanese government's forbidding ships of its own country to go to foreign lands, the monopoly of the silk trade in the whole Far East has now fallen into the hands of the Portuguese merchants in Macau, so that the total income of this import is expected to rise to 400 seraphim as opposed to 100 seraphim last year and the year before.